morning, everyone. How are you? If you take out your Bibles with me, turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 23 today. Slowly but surely coming to the end of this incredible book. If this is your first time with us, warm well, welcome to you and your family this morning. My name is Ryan Pastor, one of the elders here. If I haven't met you yet, welcome to Labor Day weekend. All right. Just kidding, it's not Labor Day weekend. All right, the title of today's message is... Dave. Day <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. Just kidding. The title of today's message is the following. When courage comes near. When courage and encouragement comes near. Isn't that something we all need in our lives? Encouragement and courage. Throughout the Bible, we see numerous instructions to encourage one another and verses that are meant to encourage us. It seems that as we endure this broken world, wrestle with our weaknesses and our struggles and our shortcomings, that the Word of God sees encouragement as a vital, necessary facet of our faith. We need courage and we need encouragement. Dave, you can go to the next slide there. I read a story recently of a retired junior high math teacher who shared at a public event that one year in her tenure, this was in the 60s and 70s, as her class finished a demanding project, she noticed that many of them felt exhausted and somewhat overwhelmed by the challenge at hand. And so what she decided to do was ask the students to take out a piece of paper, write down the names of the students in the class, and then in the space next to the name, jot down one encouraging thing she could say, they could say, about each of their classmates. She collected the papers, and that weekend, after throwing out the expected banter that was put on there, She wrote down the name of each of her students on a separate piece of paper and followed that by what the students had said about that person. On Monday, she gave each student his or her list. Before long, the entire morale of the classroom had changed. She overheard one student whisper, I never knew anyone noticed that. In fact, I didn't even know anyone liked me. Years later, the teacher had to attend a funeral of one of those students a promising young man who had been killed in Vietnam. The church was packed with many of his friends who had been in that junior high math class. After the reception, the parents pulled the teacher aside and said, we want to show you something. Our son was carrying this in his pocket when he was killed on the battlefield. And the father pulled out the list of all the encouraging things that the boy's classmates had said about him. And the mom said, thank you so much for doing that. He treasured it deeply. A group of his former classmates overheard the exchange and chimed in and said, I still have my list. It's in my top desk drawer at home. Now they said, I still have mine too. I even put it in my wedding album. And the third said, I bet we all have them. I carry mine in my wallet with me at all times. I share that story with you this morning simply to illustrate the following, that we all need encouragement, right? George Adams said, encouragement is oxygen to the soul. Fred Catherwood said, surely the church of Jesus Christ should be the community of encouragement because to provide a word of gospel encouragement to an overwhelmed soul is to be like Jesus, who in our text today is going to draw near and come near to the Apostle Paul in his moment of deep despair and provide for his weary soul a word of hope. Dave, you can go to the next slide. If you recall with me, the difficult situation Paul was dealing with. He had arrived in Jerusalem. The third missionary journey was done. Had this love offering for the struggling church there and surely just felt compelled to witness in a city where before he was persecuting the church. And so despite his sincerity of heart and his willingness to complete this purification ritual for the elders of the church there, a riot breaks out in the temple. Paul is almost killed but is saved by the Roman soldiers who seek to just silence the chaos and then grant him the permission to speak to the people in Aramaic from the steps of the barracks. But that doesn't end well either as violence ensues again and in response to his Christian testimony, as Paul is dragged back again into the barracks and summoned to be scourged or beaten to death with the flagellum in an attempt to extract the information. Why are they so against you? 
And so just as about the torture is about to begin, the soldiers find out that Paul was a Roman citizen. And that terrified them, for it was highly illegal to scourge a citizen who hadn't been given a fair trial. And so Acts chapter 22, verse 30, read the following. The next day, since Claudius Lysias, that's the Roman commander, he wanted to find out exactly why was Paul being accused by the Jews He released him from his chains and instructed the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to convene. He had Paul brought down and placed him before the council. So you guys ready to read the Bible together today? All right, let's bow and ask God to move mightily as we consider his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to consider the topic when courage and encouragement comes near. I confess this morning, God, that I need that. And so many of us in this room need that. But we want to tell you today, God, that the courage and the encouragement that we need most is from you. From your name. From your presence. And from your word. So would you glorify your name this morning by teaching us something life-changing and helping us to become more aware of your presence and also help us to become more like you today. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. 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 Awesome. Observation number one that I want you to notice today is that Paul goes before the council. Paul goes before the council. As mentioned, the Roman commander, whose name is Lysias, still has absolutely no idea on why these Jewish people are so intent on putting Paul to death. And surely he has this report that he has to write up for his superiors about this whole debacle. And so he has an idea that, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to call a special meeting of the Jewish council, which was the Sanhedrin. And let them get to the bottom of this mess. The Sanhedrin being this group of about 70 leading teachers of the day whose responsibility it was to interpret and apply Jewish sacred law to the affairs of the nation. And so Lysias here calls this meeting and then steps aside to watch as the proceedings unfold. Let's read the Word of God together today as we start in verse 1 of Acts chapter 23. And so Paul here looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, Brothers, and this is going to be so interesting. Listen to this phrase here and think about Paul's life and how he lived, not only after he met Jesus, but what he was doing before he met Jesus. Listen to this. Brothers, I have lived my entire life before God in all good, what is the word? Conscience to this day. Hmm. That I'm a loyal Jew. I've lived this life as a good Jewish citizen. All my life I've been faithfully trying to keep the law. My conscience is clear. Conscience is one of Paul's favorite words. He uses it twice here in Acts. He uses it over 20 times in his letters. Conscience is literally translated to know. It's that inner judge or the inner witness that you have that affirms when you do right and disapproves when you do wrong. It's the knot in the stomach that you get when you lie, cheat, steal, deceive your spouse, your friends, your neighbors, your bosses, whatever it may be. Here's what I want you to keep clear, though, about your conscience. Your conscience doesn't set the standards Your conscience merely reflects the standards that you choose to uphold. That's how a person like Hitler or Stalin can do what they did and have a a clear conscience. Here's how Warren Wearsby, man, he said this so beautifully. He said the following. David, you can go to the next slide. He says the following about the conscience. See, our conscience is like a window that lets light through it. As Christians, God's law, God's truth, and God's word is the light. And the cleaner the window, 
the more the light shines, and the dirtier the window, the dimmer the light beams. Therefore, a godly conscience is one that lets God's truth and God's light shine and is convicted in acting in ways that distort His will. A defiled conscience, however, is one that has sinned against God so much and has now become completely undependable. Even becoming convicted when doing something right instead of being convicted when doing something wrong. Paul would call this a severed or a seared conscience in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And so this is how Paul, who calls himself the chief of all sinners, can say to the Sanhedrin that I have lived my entire life in good conscience. Despite the killings, despite the persecutions, before Jesus, I was living the light that I held, which was my Jewish traditions. And after Jesus, I was living the light that I now choose to uphold, which is the goodness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers, I have lived my entire life in all good conscience. I don't know what that compels you to think of or how that challenges you, but two things I'm challenged with. First one is this. How important it is for us as parents, as individuals, and as disciple makers to ensure that we all understand the truth of God's word. There's so many people today who just are like, you know, just have a good conscience. But this world needs are not Christians who have good consciences. The world needs Christians who have godly consciences. And so understanding what God's truth, God's light, and God's grace is about, vitally important. But secondly, this is a charge for every single one of us to have our windows clean for God's light to shine through. And what does it mean to keep your light or your window clean so God's light can shine? That means being in the Word. That means abiding in the Spirit. And when you do read the word, that means applying the word to your life. And when you do dirty it a bit, because I do that on a daily basis, our charge is then to run to the Lord and confess those things so he can do what? He can wash that window clean. Friends, that's a church that brings the kingdom of heaven down to earth. Christians committed to living radically for the glory of God. God's charge to you and I today to live with godly consciences. That's what your family needs. That's what your world needs. That's what your work environment needs. And so after hearing this, Dave, you can go to the next slide. After hearing this in verse 2, look what happens. The high priest Ananias... Don't mix him up with Annas, who we read earlier in the book, an equally as wicked, arrogant, and manipulative man. Then ordered those who were standing next to Paul to strike him in the mouth, to slap him on the mouth. Who else was slapped on the mouth on trial? Anyone else? Jesus, right in John chapter 18. But here's one of the multitude of reasons why I absolutely love the Bible, because it never hesitates to show us the flaws and the frailties of even the heroes of the faith. Because where Jesus didn't revile in return, what you're about to see right here, Paul's going to lose it. He's going to lose it a little bit. It's been a long day, bro. It's been a long week. Now, it's been a long life since you met Jesus, suffering and opposition at any turn. So look what he says here. And Paul said to them, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You're sitting there judging me according to the law, yet in violation of the law. You're ordering me to be struck. Who do you think you are? That feels pretty good, actually. Who do you think? You're a hypocrite. Simmer down, Paul. Getting pretty intense here, bro. What I want you to know is that during these days, the Jews painted their tombs what color? painted them white. And so they painted them white so that the public wouldn't come touch the tombs so that they would become ceremonially unclean. And so what Paul is saying here to Ananias, the high priest, that on the outside you look clean, people uphold you publicly, but inside you're defiled, you're dirty, and you're rotten before God. And even though Paul didn't say it in the best way, two things that he got right. Firstly, Ananias was a wicked man. He was stealing tithes from God's church and using it for his own personal glory. And he was more concerned with his position with Rome than caring for the flock of God. And secondly, Paul was right because ultimately what he said would prove to be prophetic. In 66 AD, the Jews would revolt against Rome and ultimately turn against Ananias because of his 
desire to be in allegiance with Rome. And you guess what happened? So they ultimately find Ananias hiding in an aqueduct below Herod's palace, which is like a sewage pipe. A sewage pipe. And what they do is they drag Ananias out, and guess what they do to him? They strike him down. God is going to strike you down, you whitewashed wall. And after hearing Paul respond in this rather flippant manner, look at what the other people on the Sanhedrin say to him in verse 4. He said that those standing nearby him said, You dare revile God's high priest, the one God has put there? And suddenly, guess what happens to Paul's conscience? His conscience is pricked, right? And he says this and confesses in verse 5. I did not know, brothers, that Ananias was the high priest. For it is written, let this sink in, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Hmm. Now let me just uh, get into this a a little bit. How did Paul not know Ananias was the high priest? Let me give him the benefit of the doubt for three reasons. Firstly, Paul had been uh, been away for how long? 20 years. And so maybe he was not privy privy to the leadership structure. Secondly, this was an impromptu meeting brought about by Lysias. And so maybe Ananias wasn't wearing his... His robes, right? His high priestly, his robes. Or thirdly, here's another one. Paul in Galatians 4 and Galatians 6 says that he had a physical infirmity. And in Galatians 6 he says that I had to write my letters with large letters. Meaning that what could have been bad? His his eyesight could have been, he was beaten up so many times, maybe his eyesight was bad. And so maybe in this dark, dimly lit room, he couldn't really see who Ananias was. Or, let's just say that Paul was a man, and he was pretty weak right here, and he was just being sarcastic to the high priest. I never knew that a dude like you could ever be the high priest of a nation. All right? One of those things probably hap- happened there. Uh, let me say that he messed up. That's my own opinion. You decide. Either way, I want you to see this, though. That Paul never showed disrespect to what? To the office of high priest. But what he did find out in this exchange is that he was not going to get a fair trial. And so what he needs to do, because he's probably going to get put to death, he needs to switch his tactics. Paul's great. And so here's what he does. He switches tactics in verse 6. Here's what it says. It says, when he realizes that one part of them were the Sadducees and the other part of the Pharisees, he saw an opportunity. He's like, ah, this is great. So he cries out in the Sanhedrin, brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of the Pharisees. I am being judged because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. He knew that there was tension there between these fellas. Sadducees, disciples of Moses, only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't believe in life after death. Pharisees believed in the whole Old Testament canon and believed that yeah, there was life after death. And so Paul knew that this tension was there and leveraged it as suddenly in verse 7, you can go to verse 7 here, it says the following. When a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees affirm them all. And the shouting grew loud, and some of the scribes of the Pharisee party actually got up and argued intensely. Here comes another brawl. This day has been full of brawls. As he says, we find nothing evil with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him on the road to Damascus or while he was in Jerusalem that time telling him to get out of the city? We find no evil in this man. Friends, this is just a glimpse into the tense and volatile atmosphere that there was in the entire city of Jerusalem. And so in light of that, let's take a breath and let me just point out to you just two forms of application that I pray the Holy Spirit prompted you as you read those verses from Acts chapter 23. Let me take a drink. First thing I want you to notice in this scripture, you can go to the next slide, is this. I see in this section a call to godly confession. To godly confession. Pretty evident, I don't know if it is evident to you, that this wasn't one of Paul's finest days as a minister of the gospel, as a follower of Christ. Slapped in the face, he appears to respond in a rather antagonistic manner. God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall, you hypocrite. Who do you think you are? Probably not his best day. Completely contrary to Jesus. And look at this. Completely contrary to what he wrote to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at this. When we are reviled, we bless. Really? When we are persecuted, we endure When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now we're like the scum of the earth, like everyone's garbage, but our response is always filled with liar, Paul. You're lying, bro. Like I said, I love that the Bible never hesitates to show the frailties and the flaws 
of even the heroes of the faith. But here's the beauty in this brokenness. Paul does show us how to respond when our weaknesses do come up in our lives. Did you notice it? Paul's rebellion is immediately met with his confession, right? I did not know that he was the high priest. And one should never speak evil of a ruler of your people. I confess even in this public, I confess that that was wrong. And see, friends, right here is the godly model to managing our messes. Three things that I pray that you will take away here. Managing our messes. First one's evaluation. Second one's confession. The third one's the hardest, reception. First one, evaluation. Every one of us needs to have a humble evaluation of ourselves. That even if we are Christians, yes, we're saved, we're justified before God, but we are all works in progress. Can I get an amen today? That we all are messing up continually. I'll say every single day we're messing up. Look what 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 says. It said, if you say you have no sin, you're stupid. No, it doesn't say that. It says, you're deceiving yourselves. Or the tr- even worse, the truth is not in you. You are and I am a work in progress. And when we do miss the mark, Paul gives us our next step. It's to humbly... Confess those confessions, the next step. And what do I mean by humbly confess? All right? Here's what I mean by humbly confess. I mean being completely honest with God about your motivations, about your intentions, and about your actions, measuring it with the Word of God. Ultimately, if I were to put it bluntly to you, be real with God. And not, don't only stop there, ask Him to reveal to you anything that you don't see in your heart. That's a good place to start because we're blind to a lot of our sin. Psalm 139 is amazing. It says, Search me. What a great prayer. Search me, Father, and know my heart. Test me and even know my thoughts, God. And if there's anything that is offensive to you and your word, God, would you lead me? Would you guide me to the way that is everlasting? God, I messed up. But you know what I want to tell you today, God? That I'm a lot more messed up than this one mess up. And I need you to show me that, God. Because I want to be more like you. Evaluation, confession. And here's the hardest part for me in my walk with God. It's the reception. It's the reception of his unending grace. Because God does not require retribution for your sins or repayment for your sins. Because get what? If you're a Christian, your ledger is clear. That's insane. That just makes me want to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, today that my ledger is kept because I've racked up a huge charge before God. And when I go to him one day, it's going to be clear. But when I do sin right now and as I'm wrestling my flesh away, I confess it. And do you know what my confession is met with? It's met with forgiveness that I've just got to receive it as a gift. I don't want to right my wrongs or rectify my ways. I've just got to receive it. Notice what First John says there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Thank you, God, today for being faithful in this. You are faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from just a portion of our unrighteousness. Did you read the verse? It's crazy. To forgive us of all our unrighteousness, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can we clap for Jesus today? That's pretty stinking awesome. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for us. You know what I think of Jesus? Jesus is our mediator. He's our advocate. He's our interceder. You can read about that in Romans chapter 8. You know what I just imagine? This is not biblical. This is just me you know, dreaming a little bit. I'm just imagining him up in heaven as our interceder and our mediator, sitting at the throne of heaven. And every time we come to him as his children and say, God, I messed up. I'm sorry. I need your help. I need your forgiveness. I'm just imagining him leaning over to God and saying, that's my child. I've paid for that already. That's my child. I've paid for that already. And God responding saying, I'm going to wipe his conscience clean again so that he can shine my light all over again. And so why wouldn't I be living in constant confession? Father, I'm sorry. Would you help me? Father, I'm sorry. Would you help me? But here's also the catch. When we hear God's grace like that, that grace doesn't compel us to live like we were. That grace compels us to change, to put that action to death. And maybe the way that God wants you to do that is confess your sin to who? To another brother or trusted companion in the faith, another sister in the faith. As James says that we should confess our sins to one another for accountability, for encouragement. Or that may even mean going to someone that you've wronged and asking for forgiveness. That's what it may mean to clear your conscience. Either way, this is a call to 
godly confession. If God is prompting you right now with something in your life that is not according to his will, I'll, you don't have to listen to me. Most of you fall asleep most of the time anyway. So if you want to pray right now and say, God, I want to come before you. I've got things that I need to clear my conscience of. You can go to him right now and he will listen to you. And he will clean you right now. And he will help you have a godly, clear conscience. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want you to notice here is, uh, I don't know if you, you saw this, but a godly consideration for authority. Did you see it in what Paul said there? He even quoted Exodus twenty two twenty eight. 28. He said this, No one should speak evil or blaspheme a ruler of your people. Regardless of how corrupt, wicked, manipulative that person in office may be, as Christians, our call is to always show respect for authority and those in leadership positions. That's challenging. Anybody? I believe this truth is very timely for us as the political engines of our nation begin to ignite and the debates begin to ignite relationally in our families, work, media, social media, and begin to consume our lives. So here's my question to the body of Christ today. How do we, like Paul, shine God's light in the upcoming season that tends to be so divisive and also can be so darn discouraging? How do we do that? Two brief thoughts just for you to cling to today out of the gamut that we could have. Two things. The first one is this. If I could only get this in my life, oof, and I pray if you could only get this in your life, it would change everything. First one is this, that God is sovereign. Man, that changes everything. Let me unpack that, saying this. Our God is ruling and reigning over every aspect of the universe. Huh? God is in charge of every nation over all of history, including the daily decisions of rulers and governments across this planet. Our God reigns. Can we say that together? Our God reigns. Which means, listen to this, that no matter who is in power, no matter what policies they promote, no matter what agendas they present, thank you Jesus for this, that God's kingdom will come to pass. And there is nothing that any establishment or scheme of the enemy can do about it because our God reigns. Hear that today. Our God reigns reigns. Even scripture in Daniel says that our God is the one who removes and establishes kings. He is the most high ruler of every human kingdom. Our God reigns. He is sovereign. And if we only could rest in that biblical reality, you know what that produces within us? Peace. That produces peace and surety even during problematic political times. Because even though evil people abuse their power, above the narrative of political times stands this promise in Romans chapter 8. That all things are going to work together for the good who love him and are called according to his purposes. Listen today, our God reigns. That's good news. And the second one is this. Pretty passionate about that one. second one is this. Is that government does not save people. Nowhere in the New Testament do you see Jesus or his disciples urging believers to transform the world through the means of government. They were never encouraged to disobey, revolt, or disregard policy, even though the laws of the land were unjust. Think of the Roman Empire at the time. Countless unjust systems they had in place. Yet their charge was not to change the world through man's power. What was their charge? Go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spread my good news and live a life that puts my saving power on display. That was their charge. Here's how I heard it put before. Our mission lies not in changing a nation through political reform, but in changing hearts through the radical power of the Word of God. That's our responsibility, right? Our responsibility is obey the law, be good citizens, to exercise our freedom to vote for the best representative of our Christian values. And thereafter, in Romans chapter 13, to submit to the leadership, to honor, to respect, and to pray for those whom God has put into place. And yeah, let me just affirm this one more time because I think it's so important. I've seen it too often. Please don't fall into the trap of fixing your hope or this nation's spiritual welfare on the shoulders and campaigns of political figures or government officials. The salvation of man comes through Jesus alone. Government doesn't save, Jesus saves. If we could just get that into our hard noggins, it would change a lot of the way that we live during even politically divisive times. 
That's the first thing, Paul before the council. Secondly, as we begin to close today, can you go to the next slide, please, Dave? Is uh, Paul is encouraged by Christ. This part is just so awesome. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees are going at it. I really wanted to see what that looks like. Have you ever imagined what pastors would look like if they were to fight each other? <laughs> what would the Sadducees look like? Okay, stick my boy. I mean, what does that mean? So here they are, verse 10. Why did I do this? I have no idea. Um, verse 10. When the dispute became violent, what does that look like in the Sadducees? The commander, who's Lysias, yo, he must have been so over this by now. I just want to find out why you hate him. Stop fighting. Stop it. Why do you hate him? He must have been so infuriated. Anyway, feared that Paul might be torn apart. That's vicious language there. That's the same language used for the demoniac who was breaking chains in Mark. They were literally going to try and tear him to pieces and ordered that the troops go down, take him away, and put him in the barracks. That marks one of the deepest, darkest, most disappointing times in Paul's life. Surely, here was Paul sitting alone in a prison chained with so many disappointments to deal with. A love offering that was supposed to be for the struggling church only met with suspicion. A ritual performed to prove his genuineness only resulting in a riot. An audience with the Sanhedrin. Man, if I only could get them to believe the gospel, what is this going to do for the nation of Israel? And guess what? Only deeper hurt, deeper hatred rather than healed souls. And a dream of witnessing in Rome Seemingly completing the in tatters, probably executing, awaiting him in the days ahead. Alone, discouraged, despondent, Paul sits chained in a cold and desperate prison cell. But guess what happens? <laughs> guess who comes near? It's not an angel. It's not a vision. It's not a vision. Guess who comes near to Paul? It says this, the following night, Jesus stood by him. Whew. That changes everything. And he said to him, have what? Courage. The verb there is actually translated take courage. That's interesting. Think about that. Take it. Take it, Paul. It's a verb. And listen to this. Six of the seven times that that verb is used in Scripture, guess who says it? Jesus says it. Six of the seven times in divine Scripture, that verb is only said by Jesus. That's interesting. To the paralytic, to the woman with the issue of blood, to the disciples when they're in that storm, they think they're going to die. Jesus comes walking to them on the water and says what? Take courage. The disciples in the upper room, Jesus says, ah, it's going to get bad, guys. In this world, you're going to have tribulation, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. That's interesting. Take courage, for who has overcome the world? I have overcome the world. And so surely we take from that that Jesus is the Lord who encourages the discouraged. And so where should the discouraged go? They should go to... Jesus. Jesus is the one who provides hope to the hopeless. I've seen what you've done, I, that you've testified to me in Jerusalem. I've seen it. I know it hasn't ended up as you might have. You're disappointed. You're alone. You're dejected. And you wish that the Sanhedrin would have believed, but I've seen your faithfulness. You know, it's so important that, that, that as servants of God, our duty and our call is not to manufacture the fruit. Our duty is to be faithful. That's it. We can't understand the fruit, and so we should be encouraged by being faithful. I've seen what you've done for me in Jerusalem, and also it is necessary for you now to testify to me in Rome. You see, Jesus doesn't tell Paul that, dude, it's going to be still hard up ahead. You've got two years of custody in Caesarea. You've got a shipwreck in the Mediterranean. You're going to be a prisoner in Rome for the rest of your life. But he does tell them that you're going to bear witness for me all the way to Rome in Italy. Or in other words, here's what Jesus said to him. I'm not done with you yet. Here's what one person, one theologian said this. God's servants are immortal until his work with them is done. Isn't that interesting? Think about that. God's servants are immortal until his work with them is done. I.e., Paul, here I am. Take courage. 
It's a command. Take it from me. So as we close today, I just wanted to mention this one last thing. Dave, you can go to the last slide. I see in this section a call to... You can go back one, Dave. That'll be good. I see in this section a call to godly courage. To godly courage. Let me set the stage here as we finish. That you may have stepped into church today feeling very similar to Paul, that you're in a prison of your difficulties. Maybe physical ailment, financial crisis, heartache, that there is a loved one in your life that had wants nothing to do with Jesus. Where you feel that no one knows what you're going through. But hear me today. Whatever your circumstances, even if no other human being on earth knows what you're going through, here are four truths that you can take today for your courage. First one is this, that God knows. That He is sovereign over all the nations and so He is sovereign over your life today. That He is intimately acquainted with all of your ways. Let this sink in. God knows what you're going through. Second thing for your courage, God is with you in your struggles. Just as he stands near Paul in prison, God's Spirit stands near, draws near to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for drawing near to us today. Even the testimony of Scripture says to us that Jesus doesn't see the flames of hardship in our life as something that can keep him away from us. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was thrown into the flames. And King Nebuchadnezzar looked at the flames and said, oh my gosh, there was three, but now there's four. Who was standing in the flames? You may be in the flames today, but there is one who draws near to you. He's not scared of your flames and your hardship. Thirdly, God understands what you're going through. You may be weak, feeling alone, despondent, suffering, depressed. God knew that about Paul. God knows that about you today. And God hasn't come to condemn those feelings. He understands. He's the great high priest who sympathizes with you. And he has come to encourage you. And lastly, God has not given up on you. Paul may have given up on his, himself right here. Man, I'm such a failure. Why couldn't I preach the gospel? This is ruined. There's nothing that I can do. But even though Paul had probably given up on himself, God had not given up on him. You may have given up on your marriage, on your kids, on your life, your missionary mission and ministry, 